they've uh, heard it many times before. <laughs> yeah. So we're here today on the March 9th, 2021, uh, 4 o'clock p.m. Judiciary Committee meeting uh, based upon a corrected meeting agenda. And at this time, I have the, uh, the privilege and obligation to read you the following. Thanks for joining us for the City of Oklahoma City's video conference Judiciary Committee meeting. We have a few announcements to make regarding the virtual meeting. Number one, if the video conference is disconnected at any time during the meeting, the meeting shall be stopped and reconvened once the audio connection is restored. If communications are unable to be restored within 15 minutes, items remaining for consideration will be continued to the next Judiciary Committee special meeting to be announced at a later date. Number two, the agenda and documents are located on OKC uh, dot gov. And number three, um, at this time, I will call the meeting to order. So, Nikki, you there? I'm here. Okay, okay. Uh, Michael, you here? I don't show him on our list of who's connected. Okay, let's go ahead and get started and, and hopefully he'll he'll join us momentarily. But uh, the first uh, agenda item is the approval of the minutes of the June 11th, 2020 Judiciary Committee meeting. I've reviewed those minutes. Uh, if there's any changes, please let me know. If not, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Second. Second. And then uh, are we doing... Galen, individuals? Yeah, roll call. Uh, Greenwell? Yes. Hammond? Yes. Nice. Councilwoman? Yes. And Councilwoman Stone Cipher? Yes, please. All right. So we're at the moment where we're supposed to be talking with Michael, and it doesn't appear he's on. So why don't we put that later in the, um, the, uh, agenda. And if we could, LaShawn, could we go to number five and number six and you and Judge James kind of give us a description. Uh, what I'm really focusing on is uh, our daily inmate rate and our release time, which all is a function of how much we pay uh, Oklahoma County for use of the jail. You there, LaShawn? I am. Judge, okay. did you want to speak or you want me to go ahead? So you have all the stats. You know, okay. you know I'm, I'm going to be giving anecdotal in, in, uh, information, but you have all the stats that I can go after you. Okay. So, Councilman Stone Cipher, uh, first I'm going to go over our uh, average monthly inmate bookings. And so, this is where we look at our jail blotter. Um, weekly, I mean daily, we look at our jail blotter daily to determine how many inmates that we have in custody on municipal charges. Keeping in mind that none of our inmates um, on municipal charges, they are taken upstairs, they are not taken upstairs. So the, the maximum amount of time that a person is sp supposed to be in jail is no more than 10 hours. And that is for substance abuse related offenses. Any other charges, uh, we have a standing judicial order that uh, directs the county jail to release those individuals immediately on an OR bond. And going back to the substance abuse charges, there's a waiting period that um, that a, a defendant has to uh, to determine that they're no longer incarcerated before we let them out and get behind the wheel of a car. So that's where that 10 hour waiting period comes in. So our um, our average, we're averaging um, daily about five to seven inmates a day uh, that are detained in the, the Oklahoma County Detention Center. And again, those are the uh, inmates with substance abuse charges. So we continue to have an average of five to seven. In February, we, we had a total of five um, inmates daily in the Oklahoma County Jail when we checked our inmate uh, uh, SNAP list. And that is checked every morning at eight o'clock, Monday through Friday. 
Um, our average jail release time. Well, before I go to the average jail release time, does anyone have any questions on the our, our daily uh, inmate booking stats that I just went over? The one thing I'd like to, to just from a historical perspective is explain, I know when I first got on this committee and, and Pete White was the chair, we were spending hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, with the county jail on a monthly basis. And so I think it's important for LaShawn to point out how much money we are saving the city uh, by uh, uh, using these th this method methodology. Yes, Councilman Stonecipher. The last time I got the figures from uh, the Oklahoma City Police Department, because that's a contract that they actually uh, manage, uh, we were almost right at $2 million savings from the time we started our reform efforts till today. Um, so there is a savings uh, with not using the jail and also I mean, with, 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 with the reform issues that we put in place. And then also, you know, we no longer have our 24 hour OR bond and our 24 hour OR bond would actually mean two days in jail because you would spend 24 hours in the tank before you were actually released for an OR bond. So with the elimination of the 24 hour OR bond going down to a 10 hour OR bond, we have substantially saved the city uh, quite a bit of money on our jail contract. LaShawn, this is David Greenwell. Mm -hmm. Do do we still have that, uh, I'm going to call it the detox center. Yes, we do. And in lieu of taking them to the county jail, can we still offer that as a as a alternative to taking them to jail? Yes, Councilman. Uh, we do still use our uh, public detox center. Um, that is only for public intoxication. It's not for DUI. And Cindy will have to talk uh, in regards to why we can't use it for DUI charges. I believe uh, statutorily we can't. And so I'm going to defer to Cindy so she can jump in and explain. Oh, no, that's fine. Oh, I, okay. I understand the distinction. I'm sorry. I forgot about that. Okay. I, I thought, yeah, no, thank you. That's a and, good and yeah. we still use it. The only time someone goes uh, to jail on a public detox, that's if they're being disruptive or they refuse to go to the uh, uh, detox center. Okay, thank you. Well, Sean, I don't and, mean to put you on the spot, but what's, uh, what's our, our population for the detox center? Is it 20 people? Is it 100 people? I, I have no, no idea. I have no idea, but I will definitely get that information and, and report back. Uh, the last I remember is they can probably hold about 20 or 30 in there. I, I think it's around there, but I, I don't know with COVID what they've, if they've lessened that or how they've done that. John, if you could just send us a short email on that, on, okay. on capacity and how, how COVID's affected the use of the detox center, if at all. All right. Sure, I'll take care of it. Under Roman numeral number five, do you have oh, anything? I have else? a quick question though about the, the previous kind of what we were talking about. I think I'm still curious though to understand, and I and I think this dovetails well with what I understand the jail trust to be doing at the county is to understand when our officers are still booking people, even if it's not on city charges. Um, what what county charges, I guess they would be state or federal charges um, that and again, I, I just wonder if there's maybe some opportunity to collaborate with, um, if there, if there's data that we can call from our systems about when OKCPD are booking people and, and maybe if there's like a pattern of charges that we can tell the, that jail trust um, committee about, hey, here's some stuff we've done <laughs> on yeah. our end that has lessened this, you know, here's maybe if there's like, because what I've heard is that even if the city, did, if we provided some reform or we're not booking someone into jail, there's possibly sometimes a county or state, I don't, I'm still not really familiar if there's a distinction, um, that they could be booked in on because it's essentially the same thing is my understanding. So I just, I think I'm still unclear on where there's maybe some opportunities for our involvement as a city to lessen by maybe seeing what, what are those common charges that, that could be county uh, involvement versus it's, we're not maybe booking them on city charges, but there's a county charge that's similar that they just have not uh, done the same things we have, I suppose. Cindy, uh, can you kind of explain, uh, let's say there's an arrest 
uh, let's say it's by an Oklahoma City police person. Let's say it involves a county charge and um, how that transpires. And if there's the opportunity, uh, even though it's a county charge to uh, make efforts to reduce the, the, the jail population where warranted. Sure. Um, Councilwoman, when you say I'm, you're not sure the difference between state and county, there's not a difference. Um, we just kind but of- I thought, but I just, as, never, I was like, I want to be precise. I'm just yeah, as slang uh, lawyers kind of refer to it as county because we go to the county court but it's for state charges. Um, so uh, there are a number of times I think that police officers in the city write dual charges. Uh, for instance, it could be like a DUI. Um, and if they see that there's a prior DUI in somebody's record, they will present a state charge to the DA but they also will write a city ticket for DUI and maybe some other lesser charges like the traffic offense that caused the car to get pulled over in the first place. Um, and those come to us and we generally sit on those and wait to see what the DA is gonna do with his lead charge. Um, now, what I do know uh, historically, LaShawn, you might help me out. I think it was a year or more ago that the presiding judge over at the county issued um, a list of misdemeanor charges for which, um, what was it, LaShawn, that they didn't have to be taken to jail? Well, they were granted an automatic OR bond. They still had to be taken to jail oh. in process. They were just granted. And it was underneath Judge Henderson. He he issued that, that uh, judicial order. So as far as we know, that's still in existence. It still we is. We could probably get that list for you. Um, I don't remember getting a copy of it. Maybe I did, LaShawn, do you? I have a copy of it that I can send to everyone uh, so that they can have that list. And so that's really up to the, the presiding judge over there to, to set those uh, parameters. Um, do we know if Judge Elliott has continued that or has that expired? I believe they have continued that, Councilwoman Hammond, um, because uh, Tim, Tarnabano with the uh, CJAC committee. He is really dil diligent about monitoring the state's charges in OR bonds. And so I'm, I'm in communication with him uh, on a regular basis about those who state charges. That? Who is that again? I'm sorry. Tim Tarnabano. He is uh, over the uh, Criminal Justice Advisory Committee. And so uh, he's responsible for looking at the county booking charges. And I'll send a link because all of their information can be found on the chamber's website. And he produces a very good thorough report of the stats for Oklahoma County and municipal courts on the daily bookings. And sometimes he even looks at them by charges, but I'll, I'll get that information to everyone. So Beth, the next time we meet, do you think it would be helpful to have Tim attend with us? That might be good. Yeah. I hadn't really, I didn't realize that they posted some of that, those statistics, but I think that could be helpful. Let's try to and shoot for that. Councilwoman, you are probably familiar with the chief's directive from a couple of years ago, maybe three now, uh, where the only thing that we're taking folks into jail on city charges is uh, the intoxication issue. Um, uh, if they're being violent, um, or in situations where they're indicating they're not going to stop committing the crime, like they're not going to leave from trespassing or something like that. So uh, we got a very limited number of charges coming in. So that in combination with the 10 hour OR bond situation is what's, you know, keeping folks from coming in and churning out quickly the folks that that do. Okay, um, LaShawn, anything else under uh, Roman numeral number five? Uh, Judge James, would you like to chime in? Uh, yeah, I just wanna say a couple of things. When the pandemic hit, I signed a judicial order, which is still in effect, where if someone is picked up on a, a, a municipal, an Oklahoma City Municipal Court warrant, they're just supposed to be walked through. They're supposed to, they, take them to the jail, they make sure, you know, they are who they say they are. They don't have any kind of, you know, warrants like in federal court or something. And then they're supposed to be walked through basically. 
check, book, book them in and walk them out. So the problem we are, we are, we are still having, they're not doing that. They're still holding people over there for extremely long periods of time. Somebody's supposed to be walked through. Sometimes they're over there for 10 hours extra or 24 hours extra or two and three days extra. So we're still having that problem with the jail on, on this because technically nobody, the only people that should be in jail on municipal charges are DUIs or somebody who's being combative or violent. But so that's all I have to say. So would it be helpful if, if you and I and others picked up the phone and called uh, Ms. Everest and talked to her about this? I don't, you can. I, I actually sent the, the, the I sent a letter to the to the, the Mr. Williams, who's running the jail, who's running the jail several months ago, addressing our concerns about holding municipal um, municipal uh, defendants for excessive periods of time. I have never received a response to my to my to my uh, to my letter. So that letter to the committee members. I can get you a copy. Yes. Great. Great. Okay. All right. Anything else under Roman numeral number five, uh, Judge James or Lashawn? Uh, Councilman Stonecipher, I, I I don't know if I was clear, but the average uh, jail release time when we look at the last pass. Uh, 13 months uh, while we've been in the pandemic, uh, it averages about, uh, and this is a random sample that um, our community, I mean, our community liaison to the average wait time is about 9.97. So, uh, and, and these may not be individuals just on substance abuse offenses. This is just a random sample of everybody that was booked in the county jail. Which is my point. Can you now, LaShawn, explain number six to me? Roman numeral six. Yes, Councilman Stonecipher. Um, Chief City issued a directive on October the 26th, 2018. It was the Chief's directive and um, we all worked together, uh, uh, Cindy, myself, to come up with some eligible charges for a fill release. And so that initial list um, consists of assault and battery, disorderly conduct. Now these are for individuals that are eligible for a field release. So this is the site and release program. These, uh, the, 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 the people that are arrested for these offenses, they do not go to jail and they're released in the field. And that's, in, that's assault and battery where there is no complaint of injury, no visible injury and no domestic relationship, disorderly conduct, trespassing on private property, possession of drug paraphernalia, larceny of merchandise, that's if no prior arrest or conviction for this offense are equivalent Oklahoma state offenses, destruction of property, uh, if no prior arrests or convictions for this offense, no state driver's license, driving under suspension, driving under revocation, if no prior arrests or convictions for this offense are equivalent Oklahoma state offense, possession of marijuana, uh, if, if no more than two prior arrests or convictions for this offense. And then Chief Gorley added on July the 31st, 2020, he added one more additional one, and that is failure to maintain insurance. And I can send everyone a copy of this. And basically out of the Vera report, we took the, the top 10 charges that Vera indicated that uh, were being detained in the Oklahoma County Jail on municipal court charges. And that's the way we came up with this list. So these are our top 10 charges. And then Chief Gorley added failure to maintain insurance um, when he became the chief. And so we've been operating underneath this di directive since 20, October, to October of 2018. And so again, that contributes to the number of individuals not being detained in the Oklahoma County Jail. Andy, the question I'd pose to you is, um, are you satisfied with the list that's uh, been uh, compiled by Chief City and Chief Gorley? You got, you got to unmute. You got to unmute. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I am satisfied with it because I think we're down to just folks who um, 
can't take care of themselves because they're intoxicated or they're a threat to someone else. Um, and so I am good with that. On the flip side, uh, part of what I've heard concerns from uh, at police, and I haven't seen statistics on this, so I can't quote you anything, uh, but that we are um, kind of seeing more re uh, recidivism from after we've started this site and release program um, than we were when we were actually jailing more people. I, I don't think that's unexpected. Um, and it's as a as head of prosecution, it's not anything horrible to me unless the numbers are going through the roof. Um, and I just haven't seen numbers yet on that. Would there be a way to get that? I'd be really curious if there's a way to sort of look at that data of pre those VERA recommendations and that directive and kind of what, and I, I'm sure that would be a little bit of work. So I can imagine that might take some while, a while because you're trying to see individuals, but I, I right. think it'd be interesting to understand. And we probably have to get those stats from police. Um, so I don't know, LaShawn, do you think Jason Clifton is the guy to talk yes. to? Yes, I'll just work with, I'll work with, uh, police and it will probably be our IT department and Taryn Tidwell because basically what we need to do is um, just pull these same charges um, just to see how many individuals have been arrested since we issued the chief's directive. So I'll work with everyone over there. And, and those directives were October 26, 2018 and then July 31st, 2020? That is correct. And July 31st, 2020, Chief Gourley added failure to maintain to the list. Uh, Debbie, you there? Miss Martin? Did we lose her? Debbie, you're muted. We have Michael with us now? Yes, we do. Michael's here. Hey, Michael, how are you today? I'm excellent. You are our guest of honor today. Oh, well. I am honored to be honored by the city council, my favorite city council, I might add. I bet you say that in Tulsa. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, at any rate, uh, we had a couple of things today, uh, Roman numeral number three and Roman numeral number four on the agenda that pertain to you. Uh, some of us need some uh, guidance on your organizational background as far as legal aid is concerned. And um, you, you don't have to uh, give us minute details, but just big picture, uh, your jurisdiction, where you're operating, where you're not operating, uh, what your goals are, what your mission statement is, something like that. And then uh, you were kind enough to send us your uh, 2021 budget proposal and I think a few of us will have a few questions about that. And then we have a resolution, Michael, that's been drafted by Cindy. And uh, I wanted to get your comments on that. I'm gonna let the committee take a look at that and we'll have a vote on that at a later time, but uh, just wanted to get your thoughts on that. So I'm throwing a lot out there to you. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Okay, you want me to begin? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, so Legal Aid Services of Oklahoma, uh, we call it LASSO because it's a little easier to get through, is a statewide entity that has as its mission uh, equal justice, making it a reality, uh, which is sometimes seems uh, impossible, but uh, we try very hard. As a statewide entity, Legal Aid Services of Oklahoma has offices throughout the state, 20 offices to be exact, about 240 staff, of which 150 are staff attorneys. Of the 150 staff attorneys, 70 of those staff attorneys are embedded at nonprofits across the state. Uh, most of those nonprofits are domestic violence shelters, homeless shelters, but also hospitals and health clinics, as well as reentry providers and our own community action program here in Oklahoma City. And uh, as far as priorities, certainly there is much, much greater demand for legal aid services than we can provide. So we have to come up with priorities. And one of the legal aid services of Oklahoma priorities is domestic violence. That is protecting survivors of domestic violence, getting protection orders, and then staying with them through the whole process, whether it's divorce, 
whether it's custody, visitation, and uh, making sure that they're safe as they get out and have a job and get housing. The other priority is housing itself. And certainly in this time of this pandemic, evictions has become a major uh, effort on behalf of, of Legal Aid Services Oklahoma in both Tulsa and Oklahoma City and the rest of the state as well. And I'm proud to say that Legal Aid is very successful in preventing evictions and stopping people from losing their homes and the consequential costs, not only to them, but to cities and the state as well. A third priority has to do with, for lack of a better term, consumer issues uh, that it revolves around debt quite a bit. And certainly with COVID taking jobs away and shuttering businesses, debt has been unpaid, yet debt collection still goes on and sometimes is as aggressive as ever. So legal aid certainly does what it can to stop aggressive debt collection, to resolve debts, to even do bankruptcies if necessary, to help people not have their wage garnishes or their cars repossessed and to keep people working and keep them in their homes. And then the final priority has to do with uh, what we call benefits. And that's basically income, growing income. Uh, we take a low income family and we say, are you getting your child support? Uh, have your wages been paid? Are you eligible for social security? What about VA benefits? What about food stamps? What about tax credits? And we go down the whole list, including Sooner Care, all the various benefits programs that bring extra income, or we look at debt. There's a lot of folks paying debt they shouldn't be paying. So illegal debts as well to maximize the income so they can pay things like rent. And certainly we have special programs, not only for victims of domestic violence, but for veterans, for seniors, for persons uh, being released from incarceration and for numerous people who are disabled. And there's probably more, but I can't remember because there's just so many. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. So again, ask me questions and I'll do my best to give you an answer about Legal Aid Services Oklahoma. If you could kind of uh, paint a picture for us uh, about your organizational structure. And what I mean by that is, um, are you a nonprofit? Do you have a board of directors? Who's the chair of the board? How many people sit on the board? Um, uh, where's the home office? Where does the board meet, et cetera? Be glad to do that. Uh, Legal Aid Service Oklahoma is a nonprofit and there is a board of directors. It's not your usual board of directors in that because of a large funding source, it has to be 60% attorneys, 40% client eligible persons, and then we have a wild card, which is our accountant. So most of the times when you're on a nonprofit board, which I know probably a lot of you serve on, there may be a attorney uh, who does the, the attorney stuff, but I have 60% of 25, so I have 13 attorneys, and they're from all over the state, as well as the clients. We try to get not only diversity as far as race, but diversity as far as geography as well. They meet quarterly, and they meet alternate sites between Oklahoma City and Tulsa, and the main offices, the administrative offices of Legal Aid Service Oklahoma is right here in Oklahoma City. And who's the chair of your uh, board currently? The current chair is Chip Eads. He's an attorney out of Elk City. So we can get a, a, a bigger picture of what the board oversees. Can you kind of tell us what your overall annual operating budget is? And uh, is that represented on the 2020-2021 budget proposal summary that you sent to us? Number one. And number two, uh, are these the sources from which you obtain your funding? That is all correct, Councilman Stonecipher. There are over 100 funding sources. And as you can imagine, there's somebody constantly monitoring legal aid or asking for monthly or quarterly reports every day. But that's, that's the price of uh, providing the services that we provide. They're not always popular. They certainly are needed. But uh, when you think about food and shelter as being important, you don't always think about having access to legal services, but certainly without that access, sometimes you don't have food or shelter. So that's our current budget. And uh, it's certainly been a, a wild ride, uh, but there's been opportunities through COVID that we didn't expect, but uh, certainly looking forward, there's going to be more and more need as we go forward. And uh, Legal Aid is constantly looking for opportunities. Certainly the opportunities I mentioned with the embedded attorneys, those represent partnerships with nonprofits where we do things together, resource development together to raise the money for the attorney. 
And certainly there are opportunities that we seek every day with the tribes, uh, other cities, other counties, and corporate entities and private foundations as well. And, and David Greenwell is much better at this than I am, but, but I take it that in 2020, your total revenues were 14 million 400 plus and your total expenses were 14 million 32,000. Is that That's correct? That's what the auditor said. <laughs> so we're going to go with that. And who's the auditor that you use? Oh, geez. I don't know if I know their name. It's okay. if, if you could okay. send that, send that to Debbie Martin, that would be yes. helpful. That's and then the, the next question I have is um, under the heading total state funding for 2020, is it accurate to say that um, uh, Oklahoma City uh, provides about $544,625? Yeah, what, whatever that reflects there, that's correct. I mean, that's our, our contract with uh, the public defender. Uh, the CDBG, that's a new grant. It just went into effect this year, which is very needed. And there has been a social services grant as well as a emergency shelter grant, not an emergency shelter COVID. So a couple of those are special, maybe related to COVID, but those are all uh, the uh, you know generous act, actions of, of the city of Oklahoma City is helping legal aid and helping legal aid help its citizens. If, if we were to, and, and I'm not, I'm just trying to get a, a picture for this, but if we were to look at Tulsa's contributions on an annual basis, are they proportionate to what we're contributing at 544,625 or are they substantially less? I would think they would be close because of the same grant. Uh, there's an emergency shelter grant in Tulsa. There's an emergency shelter grant in COVID. Uh, there's a uh, CDBG pending. So those are all the same grants. The only one would be different would be the public defender contracts, which we do not have in Tulsa. And the other advantage that Tulsa has, as you know, is they have a large philanthropic community that, that uh, is, has been kind of legal aid in the past. And just so we'll understand, they're, they're public defenders. Uh, how, is that, how is that handled and how is that funded? I'm not sure, Councilman Stonecipher, how, how it's funded. I can't say that one big difference is that Tulsa United Way uh, co contributes significantly more than the Oklahoma City United Way, which helps us. Okay, well, um, I'll open it up to questions. If anybody has any questions about just the, the organizational structure of legal aid, and then uh, let's talk about the resolution next. Hey, Michael, this is an indirect question. Yes. Do you happen to know, because about the time that COVID hit, the US bankruptcy court was introducing a small bankruptcy uh, section designed to, uh, you know, get the smaller bankruptcies through the system much quicker, especially small businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, did that ever take off? Because it hit about the time that COVID hit and I just don't have, have any information. Did that help any? Council Greenwell, I don't know, but I can certainly talk to the legal aid bankruptcy attorneys, find out, and I'll get back to you. I'll just send the information to Debbie. Well, thank you. And again, I'm sorry to interrupt the committee with that question. It just since you mentioned that you all do bankruptcy, I was wondering if that assisted in your efforts to get those bankruptcies through quicker. Yeah, thank you. One other question I forgot. Um, just so those of us that, that, that don't know you that well, uh, or some of us don't. Uh, can you kind of give us your background and what your day-to-day -day looks like at Legal Aid? Well, I can give you my background story. It's not all that exciting, but I'll let you have it. Um, I went to, well, I was raised in Chicago and, and my family moved to Phoenix, Arizona when I was about 12 or 13. So I finished high school there. Uh, I did my undergrad at Arizona State. And then I went to law school at Gonzaga. That's where I learned how to play basketball. But other than that, uh, once I got out of law school, I certainly knew that I wanted to do public interest law. I did public interest law at the legal aid program in Spokane, Washington. And my first employment was at a program called the Dakota Plains Legal Services in South Dakota, uh, which I was a staff attorney, later become managing attorney of their office in Mission, South Dakota, which is basically in the big town on the Rosebud Sioux Reservation. And that was uh, enlightening for sure because there was no other private attorneys. So all the criminal appointments, all the federal court appointments all went through legal aid. 
And within six months, you know, you had five or six jury trials underneath your belt. So as I was progressing in my career, my parents back in Phoenix said, hey, when are you going to become a real lawyer? So I finally succumbed and I went into private practice for three years doing construction law. And uh, I did okay, but my problem was I couldn't say no. If I could help somebody, I would help them. Uh, I was not good at collecting debt. Uh, so I realized that that was not a good business plan and I chose to go back into legal aid. I became a managing attorney of an office in Yuma, Arizona, headquartered in Phoenix, but the office was in Yuma. And after about four years there, I thought, well, maybe I could be a director of a legal aid program. And uh, I convinced a program in Nebraska to hire me as its executive director. It was a program that covered everything but Lincoln and Omaha, most of the, the, most of the state. And I was there for six years, after which uh, I determined it'd be nice to be somewhere bigger. I was headquartered in Scotts Bluff, maybe somewhere a little warmer. So I uh, was chosen to be the executive director of a legal aid program in Jacksonville, Florida. And I was in Florida for 17 years. And then as a result of a, an aggressive uh, headhunter and an offer I couldn't refuse, I've been in Oklahoma for the last eight years. Um, I was well, let me to... say, if you don't mind, I want to say something. Mr. Biggins, sure. um, yes. your, your, your resume speaks for itself. So I just want to thank you for your good work that you're doing um, and legal aid is doing for our, our communities. And <clears throat> I had a question, but it's probably gonna pertain more to our police department. And I don't know if Ms. Cindy can possibly answer it, but I, you piqued my interest when you talked about our seniors. So I'm curious, to, and maybe you can answer it. Is there a program that you all have with our police department uh, when it comes to our seniors being taken advantage of? Uh, I don't know how that would work, but is, is there a way once uh, our seniors may report it to the police department that you all take over from there to assist the seniors? We certainly assist seniors with fraud, uh, with harm. We have an attorney embedded at Sunbeam uh, who works with that population. And certainly we go to the senior sites. We're there to do presentations. We're there to answer questions, but no cooperation in that regard with police. I would certainly invite and welcome that but that is not happening at this time. And just because you, you mentioned you just because you mentioned you do presentations, uh, I have a, a sneaking suspicion that Nikki's going to be calling you to help with some presentations, which would be a good I would, one. I would welcome that call. <laughs> you you know it. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, Katie Dilks, who's the executive director of the Oklahoma Access to Justice Foundation, and Renee Hildebrandt uh, Troxel, who's the court administrator for Oklahoma County, was kind enough to send us some statistics on evictions filed in Oklahoma County. Um, and so hopefully, uh, Michael, you got a copy of that uh, from Debbie. But um, to help me out, Joe Beth, what, how do you, how do you, Link into that. I um I was gonna try to share it, but I don't think I have access to the chat. I I look at it through the um uh oh no the Oklahoma Policy Institute hosts a website that I believe is called the oh gosh now I'm losing it. Michael, you know it. <laughs> Open Justice. Yes, Open Justice that they they host uh and it's a map. So it doesn't necessarily compare over time the way you're grafted, which I really actually really, really like, but they have a, um, a map so you can see by county. Can you see that, Michael, that's on the screen or do you have that, you see I it? I can see it on the screen. So um, with that being said, there has been a resolution that was drafted. Uh, Cindy was kind enough to draft something. And uh, what I'm gonna ask today is that, uh, that be uh, made available to all the committee members and that we have some time to digest it and make suggestions. Uh, but if you would like to comment on it in light of what the numbers we're looking at right now, do you think, uh, uh, for example, uh, we're about to see a, a big spike? Uh, are things going better than expected? Uh, just your thoughts on that and, and the purpose and thought behind wanting the resolution, please. Sure, I'd be glad to. One interesting, thing about the chart is you'll notice that the graph tends to be going up over the last three, four months. And it was initial down period over the spring uh, of 2020. That coincides with the initial 
closing of the courthouses. What are we going to do? And then you see the numbers go up and up, and they're still going up. And this is all happening while we have a moratorium. And in the past years, pre-COVID, 97% of evictions in Oklahoma County and Tulsa County are non-payment, which makes sense. Most of them, I can't pay, I get evicted. So CDC says you can't evict for non-pay, yet the evictions are continuing. So imagine what's going to happen when the day comes, and it will come when CDC says, hey, that's it. We're no, not doing any more tour anymore. Or when the rent assistance goes away forever. I mean, we got a nice chunk coming our way, which is certainly going to increase evictions. And I'll tell you why. Uh, both the CCP here in Oklahoma City and Restore Hope in Tulsa are going to conduct extensive outreach uh, with PR professionals. And they're going to reach more and more people, more and more landlords who are going to say, hey, I need to get some of this too. And it's just, it's going to create much more demand, much more people in the courthouse. That's my estimate of it. And the resolution started with the Oklahoma Access to Justice Commission. And the concern is that housing is kind of a big deal. Some people think it's a human right. And next to liberty, I suppose that's probably a big thing that nobody wants to lose. And some people think it's inherently unfair when you're at risk of losing your house and the other side has an attorney and you don't. And that's what happens 80% of the time. Uh, landlords have attorneys, tenants don't. Tenants don't even show up a lot of the time because they realize it's not going to help them. So you have this inherent unfairness. You have such a big thing at stake. And when you lose your house, it's a series of bad things that happen. I mean, you know, where am I going to live? Can I keep my job? What, how am I going to keep my kid in school? None of it's good and results in lots of costs that are borne by Oklahoma County, Oklahoma City, and the state of Oklahoma. And there's studies across the nation that show for every dollar spent preventing eviction, I mean, you save seven, eight dollars, some, some of even 10 or 12 dollars. A lot of money can be saved. So some people thought, well, maybe there should be a right to counsel. That is some kind of a, a right where people have ability to get a lawyer to represent them, make sure things are fair, make sure that maybe they avoid an eviction, maybe they work out an arrangement where they leave early. And that has become popular primarily in municipalities. And the Access to Justice Commission thought, well, maybe Oklahoma needs to have that. So they thought they would lend their support to the idea. Similarly, City of Tulsa did the same thing. They have the same issues. It's even worse there than it is in Oklahoma City. They said, we're going to lend our support to the idea. And they said, Michael, why do you just want our support? And I said, having support from the Access to Justice Commission, the city of Tulsa, and hopefully one day Oklahoma City, means that it has merit, that people of import think it has some significance, and it makes it easier for me to approach others to fund a right to counsel. And when I say fund right to counsel, what I want, what I'm trying to get is, for example, one zip code. Just last week, Milwaukee, they passed a resolution. They're trying to get one zip code. And this is a zip code that's having lots of eviction problems, lots of low-income people. One zip code where there would be a right to counsel, maybe even for a short duration, maybe six months, maybe a year. And during that time, there is a data evaluation of what's happening, what's saving, what are the outcomes, what's good, what's not. And I am confident that a pilot would result in the kind of data, and I've talked to Oklahoma City University, they're ruling the crunch data, that I could go back to Oklahoma City, Tulsa, or even at some point the state and say, look what you can save by providing a right to counsel. I know it's a long shot, maybe it's a dream, but I need to get at least support for the concept. Again, I'm not asking for a dime, just support for the concept so I can go to other entities. I can go to Much Foundation, I can go to pay for success people and say, look, city of Oklahoma City thinks it has merit. So does Tulsa. So does the Access to Justice Commission. That's my motivation. The one thing I will tell you, uh, Jim Williamson's on the call today, and he's, uh, he's our Oklahoma City auditor. And when we start getting into numbers and funding mechanisms, I'm, I'm not the best at that. And so... Um, we're, we're going we're gonna to rely on Jim some to help us look at this and, and understand it. And so the sooner you get some information, 
um, the quicker we can respond. And I don't know if you're talking days or weeks to, to get the information from OCU, but uh, uh, we really want to look at it and, and, and understand it and digest it. I will make it a priority, Councilman Seifert. Could I ask a quick question? Yeah. Uh, in regard to the resolution, are there any CARES Act funds being contemplated to fund this? It's my understanding that the, the latest round of rent assistance, you know, every time they do a new legislation, they give it a new name. This time it's Emergency Assistance Rental Program. 90% of that, according to the Department of Treasury, the Fed, is earmarked for incurred expenses like rent, like utilities. Then the other 10% could be used for legal services, legal fees, but it's pretty much being taken up by case management and all the things that CCP has to do here in Oklahoma City, Restore Hope has to do in Tulsa to make sure that the money gets out to people. Now the state uh, also got a big chunk of that money and I'm currently in negotiations with them. They're looking at maybe doing something for every county. Uh, I'm not sure what that's gonna be, but if they ask your question, the money's pretty much tied up. I mean, it could be used for it, but the other areas uh, have greater priority. And you might also wanna talk with Aubrey Hammontree because the last I heard, she might've been looking into the money trail on this issue. Well, Aubrey Hammond, she knows it all. She knows all the, you know, I've been talking to Aubrey. She's been very helpful. And yeah, she's a wonderful resource. But my understanding is that this, the city money, for sure, I'm not, I can't speak for the county, but the city money is pretty much earmarked for the 90% going to utilities and rent and the other 10% going to CCP for case management. Oh, just I, real quickly, if, if we were contemplating funding legal services for uh, eviction representation. Uh, one of the CARES Act rules uh, prohibits supplanting other grants and existing budgetary monies that we've already got earmarked for things. Um, so we can't take the CARES Act money and spend it for something that we already have money for basically. Um, and that's a pretty loose definition. I mean, there's lots of, of nuances to that. But one thing that concerns me when we talk about that is that on page two of your budget, I see uh, $250,000 for eviction foreclosure prevention. Mm -hmm. um, would that be different from the kinds of support that we're contemplating under the resolution? Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's similar, but it'd be different dollars. That's the CDBG grant. That reimburses Lasso, I think $700 for every closed case. And that's basically covering the cost for the eight attorneys who are at every eviction docket at the county courthouse uh, every day. And uh, so far, I just sent the report to Chris. I think we've got almost, over almost 150 cases already closed, of which... I think 333 would get to the max. So it looks like that grant will be spent by late summer, if not sooner. That line item, Jim. Pardon? Where's that line item? Page uh, two? Page two. Um, yeah, it'd be next to the bottom. ESG, it'd be OKC, I, CDBG. Well, I'm looking at city of OKC, CDBG, eviction, foreclosure, prevention, $249,750. That's it. it. Did you say the ESG grant? The ESG COVID, is that, is that the same yeah. thing? That is funding one attorney and one paralegal. And yes, that's being spent quickly. That would be for eviction Yes, that's all well. it's for. Okay. So subject to the uh, committee's thoughts differently, um, I would suggest that we let Jim dwell into this, uh, that we hopefully get some new additional information from OCU and otherwise, and then we come back together when we, we understand a little more um, thoroughly uh, where we are in current funding and where we are on potentially future funding. 
Chairman Stensoffer, if I could just, uh, I need to chat real quickly with Mr. Figgins, if that's okay. Sure. Um, Mr. Figgins, I worked primarily to draft this from a draft that I had from your office, as well as the uh, ultimate Tulsa resolution that was passed. Um, I had to uh, redact much of the data statements uh, because they were either they weren't sourced, so I couldn't check them, right. or they were specific to Tulsa sure. and not Oklahoma City, uh, or some uh, one of the sources seemed to me to be stale that I could check, which was the eviction lab. What I could find was 2016 and earlier. Um, so what I wanted to say in regards to that is if you have some uh, data that's specific to Oklahoma City or other data that is that you could provide me the sources that I could go in and check, I, I will be glad. I, I love to have numbers to back up a lot of these statements. So I'd be glad to put that back into the resolution um, if I can confirm those things. So I would be glad to do that. I will go to OPI and I'll go to their data person and say, hey, Give me the stats for uh, Oklahoma City, and uh, I'll share them with you, and and hopefully they'll they'll meet your satisfaction. That'd be great. Um, I know you have Debbie's contact information, and she could forward it on to me. Although mine is Cindy Richard at OKC .gov, so it's pretty simple. Um, and I will be glad to insert any of those statistics in, and then uh, I can send it out in advance to uh, the committee members. So they'll know what they'll see if, uh, when it comes up for a vote next time. Michael, thank, thank you for your presentation today. Uh, it was very informative and very helpful. Do any of the committee members have any other questions of Michael? Um, Michael, this is David Greenwell. I have just a quick one. You're okay if we could get additional funding in, in a manner that you would be reimbursed once you submitted a claim for it, as opposed to being funded up front. Yes, that is how most of the grants work. That's how the CDBG grant works. That's, that's not a problem. Thank you. And I just wanted to add, I think, because um, Cindy bringing up the eviction lab reminded me, you know, that this outside, even outside of COVID, this is a pretty huge issue for Oklahoma City. Even an eviction lab is a really good resource to look at, but that 2016 data um, is what they, uh, what we've sort of been working off in the housing world, um, recognizing that both Tulsa and Oklahoma City are in the top 20 or largest uh, cities with the most evictions um, based on that data. And and pre pre COVID, I guess 2016 through 2019, um, my understanding was that data was not really changing much. There wasn't a huge needle moving and um, where I think COVID has maybe uh, sort of shot this issue up in sort of, um, I think, notoriety of understanding like how, you know, people, people moving around in a pandemic is not great. But even prior to that, we were sort of at a crisis point of, of evictions. Um, and even um, this dovetails somewhat nicely with the um, the mayor's task force on homelessness um, that's being a uh, report, I guess, that's being put together. Um, and, and there's recommendations where we are around prevention. Um, and so that, you know, addressing right to counsel and tenants' rights and uh, knowledge for both tenants and landlords around their rights and responsibilities and that sort of education is all sort of wrapped up in what some of those recommendations I think will, will be because I think the hope for me at least is that coming out of the pandemic that we'll be able to look back and see where we've maybe um, embraced some opportunities to even improve where we were prior to the pandemic and, and bring our numbers to a, a less harmful place for our residents. And I think to Michael's points, sort of, you know, bring uh, lessen the impact on the city itself and kind of what, what the city um, absorbs as far as costs and, and just well-being for our residents as well. Councilwoman, do you know if anybody is looking at um, legislative proposals since landlord tenant law is preempted through the state? Yeah, um, I know there were a few things that were presented last year that just got, it sounded like um, side, side uh, just because you know everything kind of, it seemed like got um, sidestepped with the pandemic kind of 
right in the middle of legislative session. Um, there was a, and I, I, it's, I don't think it's, um, it was not reintroduced this year, but last year there a representative, I think it was Canada if I'm thinking of it right, was um, uh, introduced legislation to essentially bring us up to date with the national standards for the Landlord-Tenant Act. Um, um, my understanding is ours is quite uh, old. We, we have not updated it in a while, so it would update things like being able to withhold payment of rent related to updates or repairs that you made, which we currently can't do, and some of those other things, but it just, it, it's been sitting, so it hasn't really gone anywhere. Okay, uh, Nikki, do you have any further comments? Yes, um, Mr. Figgins, I do. I, I do have one request, and I'm not sure if you. I know you have, but is it possible with now since we have reconvened with our convictions to get uh, maybe an account? I heard you talk about Tulsa's members as far as a zip code, or I'm sorry, it was uh, another Wisconsin. Um, is it is it possible for us to drill it down to the zip code of, of where our impacted areas are and how we can probably get some um, extra concentration of help in those areas? Councilman Knight, it just so happens that the Oklahoma Policy Institute has given me the top 10 zip codes in Oklahoma City, and I will get that out to you through Debbie tomorrow. Thank you so much. Outstanding. Outstanding. Uh, Debbie, are you still there? Debbie Martin. I am, sir. Is there anything I failed to do or need to do before I uh, adjourn? I think not, unless the committee members have any comments in conclusion. You are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.